Welcome back. Luis Lea. Hello. Hello. Right, let's talk about types. So you're probably all familiar with basic type systems in programming languages. You've all written code with things like int x equals one or float f or string s or boolean b. Um, and you'll have noticed some languages require the programmer to write these type identifiers um, like C and other languages like Python don't. Um, notations may vary a little. You'll see in type theory, it's common to use the colon symbol. So you write the variable name, then colon and its type. So this means X of type int it means the same thing as in X or f of type float, or b of type bool. Um, you don't see this so much nowadays. In 8-bit, 16-bit era, it was quite common to indicate type as part of variable names. So you might see things like x percent equals 1 to show that x is a, an integer, um, or s string. This dollar symbol used to be read as string, s string equals hello. That's uh, B BBC basic style. Um, nowadays, you might see things like this. If you're using a, a less type language, you might put some type information in your variable name, like putting a little lowercase b to show that this is a, a Boolean. So you know, why, why do some languages make you do this and, and other languages don't? Okay, so advocates of typing will argue that types help to remove large classes of programmer error. They pre prevent the programmer from doing silly things. Um, you know, from a software engineering point of view, they can also give human programmers information about what's going on, especially if you look at an API and you see someone else's functions all covered in types, that tells you what kind of input it is expecting from you. So types are often used as a form of contract in contract-oriented programming. Yeah. Detractors of types will say extra keystrokes are needed. You can't call that typing because you're overloading the word typing if you do that. So you need more keyboarding to input this information, which slows you down. Matthew. Um, yeah, just to be clear, though, um, this isn't necessarily for or against types in particular because you can have type inference and you can have um, mm -hmm different kinds of type you've got static and dynamic but you also have strong and weak types and you have um for, for whether or not you limit the semantics of how they can be combined yeah so python wouldn't, wouldn't for example nice, is wouldn't it be nice if we could have all this type machinery but not have to write all these extra keystrokes all the time so uh, obvious well, things, one is an integer maybe we would like to uh just do the type information maybe we're running in a functional language and by having written all of the type information out and for example uh, the, the function signature or the type signature for a function or some such uh, maybe we actually have a, a, a more clear a more tight definition of what it is that we're actually laying out so maybe it's actually the other way around because it's part of if we have a declarative syntax that can actually be used as part of the definition as well yeah, right. So in, in languages with really advanced type systems like Haskell, you, you can pretty much write your whole program just inside the type system, right? There's there's going to be AI running in the type system. Yeah, there's a little AI engine, which you can then hot rod to make it do other forms of AI by encoding your entire problem as a, a type inference problem. Yeah, lots, lots of different forms of, of typing. Um, are passionately argued for and against. So you know, the, the fundamental point of these then is they are to restrict what can be expressed in the, the language. You can take a language like L1 we saw and you notice there are bad things in L1. You can say things like this, three plus true. That's admissible in the syntax. And the, in the semantics, the semantics didn't say this was wrong, but the semantics just don't have a case for it. So 
So if you write this in L1, the program will just hang because there's no semantic rule to tell it what to do. So yeah, we would really like to ban things like this from the L1 language or from any language, apart from C, which actually lets you do this. Right? You know, similarly, you know, what happens if you're going to mix up true and false and integers? Here you, you're trying to do an operator on values that have the wrong types. Here like you've got this expression can take a value that has int type or it might take boolean type, which you might want to ban. Um, and some languages will ban that. Some, some languages want this thing to always return a consistent type. So you know, this is useful to ensure that progress is occurring uh, in the language. And the, the idea then is we are going to prove theorems about every expression in a program. We're going to prove the type um, of each expression, and then we, we're going to make sure that they all match up. And this, this is another form of theorem proving. You're going to need another little AI engine built into your language that goes off and proves these theorems to do the type checking which in general is hard because it's AI. So you know, this is going to let us throw new kinds of compiler errors, which are not syntax errors. They're semantic errors. We've gone through the parsing process. Now we're going to check the meanings of those expressions in terms of their types. Yeah, so lo lots of different variations on this, right? Static typing means you do it all at compile time. You're going to do static analysis on the program, and that's when you're going to complain. Now, this tends to lead to slower development times because your programmer, they don't have to, but often they will end up having to enter keyboard all this type information. It may slow down your compile time, but it's going to give you a fast run time. You know, the alternative is you do dynamic typing, which means you're going to do this on the fly as the program is actually running. So this is a form of dynamic analysis. This typically is going to speed up your development time because the programmer doesn't have to think as much about it. Might speed up your compile time, but it's going to give you a slow run time because you're doing work at, at one time. Um, those are basic type systems. So some of you might have come across more advanced type systems. So for example, consider the type of a function. If you write something like this, you're declaring here that add is a thing called a function. Okay, And the, the type of this thing is that it takes two ints as inputs and it returns a third int as an output. So a, a neater way of writing that and more, more generalizable way of writing it is like this. We're going to say that the function has this type. It takes two inputs of ints and it returns in, as an output. Um, if you like functional programming notation, you can generalize this again. And you can say that the same function can be viewed as having this type. It's something which takes an int, and it returns a function which takes an int and returns an int. So that lets you do currying. For example, if, if you evaluate add just with a single argument, three, that will evaluate to a new function which adds three to things. So this, this notation gives you that view of curried functions. This is something you can do as just taking one argument and returning a function. Or you could re view it as taking two arguments um, and returning one integer. They're the same thing. So you might have come across languages which let you do generic types. So this gives you some ability to build data structures that can run on many different types. So for example, in C++ or Java, you can define a vector, or someone has defined a vector for you. And a vector is defined in terms of a, a template or a generic. It says a, a vector is a, a data structure which holds many objects, each of type T, which could be anything, as long as they're all the same. Um, and then you specialize it, and you can create a vector of ints, or a vector of floats, or a vector of space invaders. So you're reusing that data structure on a bunch of different types. 
there are limitations of this. Um, if you generalize this theory just about as far as it will go, you end up with what are called fully polymorphic types. So in polymorphic types, you use variables. So here, A of alpha and beta um, can be anything, like with T in a generic. But in particular, in polymorphism, A and B can be other types. So A, for example, could be the type of functions from beta to gamma, or it could be the type of functions from beta to gamma to gamma. So in this case, you might end up with a vector containing a whole bunch of functions which each have these very complex types themselves. And you can build large pyramids of fully polymorphic type. So you'll find this in languages like ML and Haskell, functional languages. Um, you know, here's a reverse list function. And this has the type alpha list to alpha list. So this function is a, an object that can be manipulated like any any other object. Well, I mean, ob object in the colloquial sense, not in the object oriented sense. It's a thing. It's a thing that can be manipulated like other things. Um, and that's its type, just like the number three um, has type integer. Um, so in particular, in languages with these more powerful type systems, you can do things like this. This is a functional. A functional is a function that takes a function as an argument and does stuff with it. So map is taking any function, and it's taking a list of x's. And map is going to go and apply that function to every element of the list. So you can see the type of map is going to be something like this. It takes a function, and the function can take any alpha and turn it into any beta. It's also going to take a list of alphas, where alpha can be anything. And the output of map is going to be a list of betas, because it's gone through this alpha list, and it's turned every alpha into a beta. Other forms of typing, um, you may have heard of duck typing. Um, this is a Python thing, um, which is an extreme form of um, dynamic typing. It's where you, you don't check the types until the very last minute when they're actually needed. And it's called, it's called duck typing because if if a if a thing in your program walks and talks like a duck, then you just assume that it is a duck, right? So if, if you've got any object that has methods walk and talk, um, and your program tries to call those methods, then if it works, then it's allowed to go through. Um, yeah, so I think someone mentioned Hindley-Milner typing. This is the, the Rolls-Royce of type systems as found in Haskell and ML. And Hindley-Milner is using AI logic and computation to infer the types of everything completely automatically. So you you have all the power of a strong type system, but without having to faff around typing all this stuff because it works it out for you um, at compile time. Hindley-Milner isn't the, the latest. It's been extended in various ways. So in the, Haskell in particular extends this further than ML does. Haskell has a more powerful type system than ML, um, which has this concept of type cases. Um, so here you can do things like define the type of even numbers. If an even number is anything which is a, an int, but is also divisible by two. Um, and you know, this, this can be used to really hot rod the type system. And when you see Haskell programmers doing all their work in the type system. This is often what they mean. So for example, in, in Haskell-like languages, you can define a type of formulas, which are basically strings in a, a logic. You can define the type of formulas and then de define the type class of theorems, where a theorem is a string that has been proved true. And so you can then take pretty much any logic problem um, that you like and shoehorn it into the, the type system to ask it to go and do all the work. David. Sorry, is it ever so like slight tangent? My mind, I, I just suddenly thought, are, are um, numbers with that 
can numbers with decimal points be declared as even or odd? Uh, well, an, e an even number is one that is divisible by two. So are they divisible by two? That's the thing, because if you're going into decimal numbers, then do you have to take into account like how many decimal places you've gone? Is it only, it's, if, it's, if it's able to divide by two and remain in the same number of decimal places, it's even or, di or is it just class as an odd number and we move on? It's, or usually, only done as, it's usually only done as a subtype of ints. So you're only an integer world in the first place. I guess you, you, you could try and define evenness and oddness for floats. Yeah, you're, you're, you're free to define these things however you like. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever argued for a standard definition of even and odd float. Okay. Okay. Sorry, my, my, just, my, my, you were talking about um, even and odd numbers, and my mind just suddenly went down that road. Like, hang on, what is an odd? What defines an odd or an even number? And <laughs> beyond integers. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. No, good. good. Okay, um, so let's look at some simple example. The type theory is a huge subject. You could do a whole course on this in many computer science programs. We're only having a very quick introductory look at it today. Um, and some of those courses are horrific, by the way. I, I remember really suffering in type theory. Very, very hard. Um, when you really study this, you're going to go off and do all these logical inferences yourself with a pencil and you know, hundreds of pages of manually inferring types, basically. Um, why? Because the whole point is to have a computer do it, really. Maybe that's how we should teach it in the future. So let's take a simple example, um, type lambda calculus. Okay, So Church created the lambda calculus, and he very quickly made a, a type version of it. And the motivation of this was, as with all type systems, was to ban certain constructions from the language that were problematic. So we saw if lambda calculus can create these non-terminating structures based on Y combinators, if you feed negation into a Y combinator, you get a, a paradox. You get an equivalent of a, a statement that if it says X equals not X, um, and so by adding types, you can ban that whole class of, of bad things from the lambda calculus. Um, if you do that, by the way, you no longer have a church powerful language, precisely because you've just banned a load of stuff from the original church powerful language. Um, and in particular, you can create a type lambda calculus where all programs are guaranteed to terminate and you get rid of the halting problem. So that comes at a cost, right? It means you, there are certain programs that can no longer be expressed in this language. But depending on your point of view, this may be a good thing or a bad thing. You, know, you might you might want to make sure that your nuclear reactor control code is never going to go into an infinite loop. And this is one way of making that guarantee. On the other hand, you might want your nuclear reactor controller to go in an infinite loop because like most industrial controllers, you actually want it to run forever in real time. So yeah, you, you take the pick. Well, the, the idea of type lambda calculus then um, is to extend these expressions with type information. So here we're going to have that little colon and we're going to say something has a type T. Okay. Um, there are base cases. Oh, we're going to have this thing called gamma. Gamma is the environment. It's similar to the dictionary we had in L1. Gamma is just storing all the state. So it's everything we already know, all the theorems we've already proved and all the, the values of, of everything that exists. So this is just saying if if that dictionary gamma already contains a statement that X has type uh, sigma, then you are allowed to go and write X has type sigma. You can say gamma proves X has type sigma. That's just a basic definition. Similarly, if C is a constant, so we normally read these things from the bottom up, right? You say, if you've got an expression like this, C colon T, um, you're allowed to accept this if C is a constant and it does in fact have type T. So these are these are basic types, you know, like in some float and so on. Um, 
And then you have the Lambda calculus rules for abstraction and for application. So abstraction means introducing the Lambda symbol. Application means applying one function to another, E1 being applied to E2. So in abstraction, you're allowed to say that this thing has type sigma goes to tau. That's a tau. It's like a Greek T. The types are usually done in Greek. Um, so you're allowed to say this thing has type sigma goes to tau if and only if um, what have we got here? If if you were to assume that X actually had type sigma, then you'd get E having type tau. Okay, so if you if you were to assume this, yeah, if it was the case that giving it X type sigma would result in E having tau, then you're allowed to write this. So if you see this in a program, your AI type system is going to go off and try and use this rule to prove whether or not um, it's acceptable, like whether you can actually make that type. No, or in in a language with Hindley-Milner inference, you're actually going to fill this in. You're going to find out what that type is and, and fill it in by using unification that we mentioned last week. Um, yeah, so the final rule is application. So here you're applying a function to an argument. So in this case, you're saying if your argument has type sigma, then you're going to need your function to have type sigma goes to tau. And if it does, you can conclude that that whole thing has type tau. So again, you might see that in the code and you're checking it with your type checker. Um, or more sophisticatedly, you might try and infer what tau actually is um, and do that automatically. Okay, so here's a simple example. Okay, here's, here's a little lambda expression that we would like to type. So we use type as a verb, yeah, to type. It doesn't mean keyboarding, it means finding the type of something. Um, or checking the type of something in this case. Well, here, here we've already been given what the type is, and our job is to check that it's okay. It would be harder to actually derive this by going the other way to find out what the, the type is. So we're gonna try and prove this, okay? It's something that takes any type tau as input and it returns tau prime goes to tau prime. So we can apply one of those rules, the rule for abstraction, and we say this is going to succeed if and only if the line above it succeeds. So here we've peeled off the function. We've said function must be of type tau matching there. This is just pattern matching against a set of rules. Um, and then we're going to need the body of the function to have this over here matching over here. And then we do it again, because this is another lambda expression. We're going to pull out rule number three. I usually give these rules nice little names. I pulled these off Wikipedia, so they just got numbers. This is sometimes called abstraction ABS, and this is called application um, APP. And I don't know what these are called. Call them whatever you like. So. Yeah, at this point, you're going to apply that rule of abstraction again, rule number three, and it says this is going to succeed if and only if everything from there has to carry over, and now x also has to have type tau prime, and you're, you're done. So don't expect you to follow all that in here. Um, if you go through it with a pencil on that slide, just try and convince yourself that, as with all the logics we've seen, right? type theory is just another bunch of logics. Um, if this is all just being done with syntax. And you can get from that theorem to that theorem using the rules of the logic. Um, so the, the point of this was really to ban these problematic constructs. So if you take, this is the Y combinator, OK? Um, and remember, this is this non-terminating non recursive structure. So if you try and claim that it has a type, um, 
Okay, I've got to hand wave a little bit here. You, you can argue that any function is going to have to have this general form. It's got to have some type going to some other type going to some other type. Um, if you're happy that there's got to be that general form, you can then apply the rules of this type system of Church's type lambda calculator. And you'll find that this only succeeds if these other two conditions succeed up here. And the thing is that this will lead to a contradiction because these are actually the same expression. They're half of a Y combinator each. So you, you'll find that the Y combinator only has a type if half a Y combinator has this type, but it also has this other type. And this is a contradiction because these things are not equal to each other. So this, this is how you prove that the Y combinator has no type and therefore it gets banned from the language. So at this point, you no longer have a church computer. You have a, what is called a total functional programming language. And that's a functional programming language which is guaranteed to terminate, and which may or may not be a good thing, depending on your point of view. Lambda calculus is the simplest programming language, right? And Therefore, we've used it as the simplest example of adding some typing rules to it. Let's see what this looks like for a bigger programming language like L1 that we saw earlier. Okay, so we're going to have to define some basic types, first of all. And this is saying T ranges over ints, booleans, and unit, where unit is kind of the the absence of a type. You know, if you just have a, if you have a command that is purely imperative, it doesn't have a value, then we're going to give that a unit type. Um, and then we need a type of uh, references for the memory. Yeah, so these these are types that go with values. These are types that go with um, names of memory locations that store the value. So here then, again, we're going to have some simple rules to get us started. So this is just saying if n is a, if n actually is an integer in the, the model theory, that's why we use the word actually. If n actually is an integer, then you may write n has type int inside the language. So this is an expression in the language. This is meta logic giving you the truth conditions for it. Similarly, you can write b colon bool if b is in fact a boolean. Once you have your basic rules, then you can put them together to type all the other constructs in the language, right? So if every construct we saw when we defined the semantics of L1 is now going to get a, a second version um, telling us how to type there's that, that kind of construct. So here's a rule for typing plus statements. OK, this simply says E1 plus E2 has type in if E1 has type in and E2 also has type in. OK, that's how you get a well, well defined type for this expression. And in particular, this is how we're banning those problematic constructs like adding booleans to ints because there's no rule for giving them a type. So they're not going to get past the, the type checker and they'll throw a typing error. Um, you know, similarly, this thing um, greater than or equal to, this is almost the same, but notice that it takes the value bool. You know, adding things gives you an int, greater than equals gives you a bool. So to do this, you've got to show that each of these expressions has type int. And then the whole thing is going to take type bool. If then else statement, yeah, this is going to have, and this, this is controversial. This is stronger than what you get in Python, for example. This says this whole expression is going to have type t as long as E1 is a bool and both of these inputs have type T. Yeah. So how, how is that stronger than Python? Uh, 
Um, in in a lot of senses, it's stronger than than Python because, well, first off, we know what the types are before we go down either branch. Um, but like even further than that, like um, what would you say? What's the way of putting it? Both um, E two and E three have the same like type. Like in a lot of other languages, not just Python, for example, um, we might have different types. So if this is the only um, if statement that we have, then the only like semantic output is we can only have a pair of expressions with the same type rather than different yeah. types. So you, you pretty much have to do this in a statically typed language because in a static language, you, you need to find the type of this at compile time. Um, and so you, you really want to say there is some T um, that this expression is always going to have. So yeah, in, in Python, you could do this. You could say if B, then hello else three, um, where you're mixing up. If this expression might end up being a string type, or it might be an int type. Now, it's, it's OK to do that in Python, because it's dynamically typed. So it, it's only at runtime that you find out what the type of this thing is. Yeah. Whereas in a, a static language, we need to assign the type to this whole expression. So this, there are ways around it. There are things like union types where you, some type systems will define a type, um, you know, something like int or string. Yeah, that, that's a union type. It's a type that, that could be either of those things. So you could try and do something like that in a static system, but it's it's going to get messy as these things propagate around the system. Um, you, know, you can have variables flo floating around that could just have pretty much any type as a result of lots of things getting union together. And then you've, you've basically just got an un untyped language um, if you're going to allow that. So you'll, you'll typically find that this kind of thing is allowed in a dynamic type language, but not in a, a static type language. Let's look at some more rules. So this this is defining this unit type. So a unit is kind of the empty type. So typically that shows up in an imperative language where you have a command that does a thing and it doesn't take a value. So again, that, that's different from C, right? We said in C, this thing does actually take the value of the expression. But in, in other languages like this L1, this thing only has a side effect. It doesn't have a value. And so it gets the type unit. And you know, this rule is saying you're only allowed to have this in your language if L is one of these references and E. In, in this case, we're restricting the memory to only storing ints, by the way. You can't store a bool in memory here. So you're saying you're only allowed to make this type in judgment if E is an int and L is an um, integer wrapper. Opposite of assignment is dereferencing. So this is reading the value of a variable. So here we've got um, exclamation mark L. And there should be a little proves sign in there. It's supposed to say gamma proves exclamation mark L has type in. So you're saying you're, you're only allowed to make this judgment if this thing is true. It says that L has to be an in ref. So this, this rule is saying you, you're not allowed to dereference booleans or ints. You can only dereference things that are actually memory addresses. Little tiny rule to say skip doesn't do anything and has unit type as well. That's for completeness. Um, yeah, what's the type of a sequence of expressions? So you've got E1 semicolon E2. So here we're going to say this thing has type T if and only if E1 has unit and E2 has T. So we might want to think a little bit about this. this. This is saying the value of that expression is only going to come from the value of the last command, which is you know, rough, roughly what you'd get. And if you had a language where you said x equals 
x equals 3, y equals 2, 7. Okay. If you if you gave that as a program, the value of this is all going to come from that thing at the end. So you're not going to take the value from the commands. So these things can have side effects, but they don't have a value that is returned. Only the, the last one takes a value. If you really think about this rule, it will recurse as well. Meaning that it's the very last statement in your whole program that actually gets the value. Then we've got a while loop. What are we going to do with a while loop? So this one's easy. You're just saying that thing has to be a bool. Um, and in this case, we're saying E2 has to be unit. It has to be a, a side effect in program rather than something with a value. So you know, there's a few things here that are not completely obvious. You know exactly how this rule works, exactly what that condition is doing. You could imagine other variations on this that would give you different semantics for the language. You know, it's not totally obvious that you need this. It's not totally obvious you need to give skip a type at all. Um, and again, these are all the things that the meta logic is there to pick up. You, know, you would like, if you were seriously going to launch L1 as a real world language, you would like to have proved first that it actually works. You'd like to prove that everything is typed correctly. Everything is either going to get a type or it's going to get thrown out for a good reason for not being part of the language. And you'd like to prove that things can't shift between types or be interpreted as, as two different types. So in, in particular, you can't do this C-like trick of treating zero as if it's false and one as if it's true. You know, that's been explicitly banned from this language. When you go to polymorphism, um, I'm not going to go into this in any significant detail at all. I simply want to convince you that full poly polymorphism is hard. <laughs> so the way I was convinced that this was hard was by being put through an entire course on type theory. And at the end of it, I learned very well that polymorphic types are hard. But I'm just going to tell you that as a fact, um, pretty much. I'll give you a little example of how things might, might quickly get hard in this area. You know, you, you'd like to be able to type all kinds of things, you know, functions of functions. So consider this mapping function again. Right. Map is a standard function. You find it in many languages. Not every language is able to do this for reasons of typing. But you typically like to take a function as an input and take a list as another input and then have map go off and apply the function to every item in the list. So here's the type of a function. It goes from A to B, alpha to beta. You take a list of alphas as your x's and you end up with a list of betas. This gets hard when recursion kicks in and recursive data structures kick in. Because as you build objects out of recursion, they get more and more complicated and their types grow. You know, a, a tree is usually made up of two other trees. So, yeah. The very lowest level of a tree might have data type alpha, but now, now you have a tree that is taking two trees of alphas, and then you have a tree made out of trees made out of trees. And somehow these things all have to share the same type, even though they are different kinds of objects. The, the simplest case I know of this is trying to type the church numerals. Um, so remember, we defined these little lambda expressions. Yeah, here's how you define zero. Here's how you define one. Here's how you define two. And roughly, these are these are functions which take a function and they iterate it a number of times um, on some input z. So it's easy to type zero. You can see zero takes two arguments s and z, and it returns z. So s could have any type. It can be alpha. Z could be any type beta, and the thing that comes back is the same as z. So this obviously has Alpha goes to beta goes to beta. Um, 
However, when you look at the number one, there's more going on here. You've built the number one out of the number zero, effectively. And so now you're taking a function and a z, and you're actually applying the function to z. So in this case, you've now got to take a function s, which has type alpha goes to beta. You've got to take a z, um, which is going to have to have type alpha, because it's the thing that that function gets applied to. And it's got to output a beta, because that's the thing that comes out of the function. If you go to the number two, you can see this appears to have a different type again. This is a stronger type because you can see for one, alpha and beta could be anything. They could be equal to each other or they might be different. When you get to two, they've all got to be the same. So now you've got alpha goes to alpha goes to alpha goes to alpha. And as you build up these church num numerals, the types appear to get more and more complicated. And this is bad because you really want all of these to have the same type because they're all supposed to be ints, and you want int to be a thing. But we appear to have a different type required for every possible int. Now, the clever bit is that it turns out that these types are actually all subtypes of each other. So you can, for example, you can write this type as a subtype of 0, or you, you can write 1 as a subtype of 0 and 2 as a subtype of 1. And it's not obvious initially how to do this. It turns out this is the same problem we saw last week called unification. You've got two hierarchical structures full of parameters, and you're trying to pick values of the parameters to make them equal to one another. So a type system doing this is going to have to have a, a unification module built into it, and it's got to figure out what's the most general type. So for, for church numerals, it turns out that all of these other types are subtypes of the one we already got for zero. This is getting complicated, though, because you have a number floating around like two. And initially, it seemed to have this type. And now we've realized that's also a form of this type. And for some of our calculations, we want to use its original form. And other times, we want to use its more general form. And this is all stuff that your AI system in the type checker is going to have to put up. This is just here as a picture. I'm not going to explain this in that level of detail. This, these are the equations for the Hindley-Milner type inference algorithm. Just to show you that they exist and that they exist as logical rules with similar forms to all the other logics that we've seen. Roughly, this is saying, here's abstraction, right? That is a rule for typing a lambda abstraction. That's called abs. There's a rule for typing function applications. There's a function application, and it's saying it's going to have this type. And very roughly, the trick is that MGU stands for most general unifier. It's saying you have to go off and call unification as we saw in other theorem proving methods. You're going to have to do some unification to deal with the polymorphism in the type. So this is what's going on in your ML um, or your Haskell under the cover. You've actually got a full logical inference system sitting there in the background that is proving theorems about the types of all your variables um, as you go along. And in particular, there are ways of hot rodding that system to make it do other forms of AI logical inference. You know, if you've already got a logic inference engine baked into your language for type checking, you can turn all kinds of other problems into type checking problems and then just give them to the type checker to sort out. Of. It's a little bit like how um, GPUs evolved. The GPUs were supposed to be for doing graphics, and then people figured they could express many other problems as graphics problems and feed them to the GPU to make use of its computing abilities. So similar ideas here, right? People hot, hot rodding the type system to use it as a general AI inference engine. And there, there are deep connections here to the um, Curry-Howard theorem that we mentioned last week, this connection between logic and computation. Showing that they're the same thing. 
And if you can remember when we look back at um, Hilbert style inference systems, do, do you remember we, we saw there's ways of setting up human style inference with a minimal set of rules. And we noticed that those rules ended up with the same names as the combinators of Lambda Calculus, right? S, K, and I. It turns out following this, that there's this deep connection between type theory and logic and computation. And those, those rules, I had to look this up by the way, um, those rules take those names because it turns out that proving the types of combinators is equivalent, exactly equivalent to doing inference um, in that kind of um, Hilbert style logical system. So there's, if you've got a type checker, you've got a full AI inference system by the Curry Howard theory. So, you know, some ex excellent work has been done on the Hindley Milner type system in, in its meta logic level. You know, people have studied this system as an object in itself, and they, they've done things like prove that it is deterministic, they can prove that it terminates, they can prove that the type checker will always work and that it will never get stuck. That was a very short introduction to types. Matthew. Um, it's actually interesting. I was just thinking about, you said about the requirement for basically continually proving the state of the program. How does that affect um, the complexity of things? Because obviously you can do those proofs statically before there's any execution that occurs. Mm -hmm. um, but how would you actually derive the complexity of something like that? Because surely if we have something as peculiarly typed as um, like a church enumeral, um, which in theory can have just uh, an infinitely long type, mm. but we can unify it into a, a generic type. Um, how do, do you, would you um, how would explore you do that? One, uh, no, because obviously, uh, yeah, how do you do unification? Incredible. Um, yeah. Unification is really, really hard, and it's a really, really interesting um, set of problems. And obviously, um, for something like that, I assume that you can't, depending on the type system, I imagine, you can't always guarantee that you can eventually unify that type up, because obviously yeah. you can have as ridiculously long of a function as you, as you want. So you know this this is part of how programming language conferences manage to create thousands of pages of new stuff every year, right? People can propose different systems and then suggest algorithms for doing inference on them and then proving metalogic theorems about those the systems. Yeah, and it's it's hard. Um, you know, Hind Hindley Milner, it, this runs statically which when you think about it is incredible. It figures out the types of everything in your program, even if you've got horrific things with recursion and you know, needing these general unified types. It will run statically and figure everything out. There are different algorithms for actually doing it. So Hindley Milner itself is just a set of rules. It's these rules and it doesn't tell you how to actually apply them. It doesn't tell you what order they should be applied in. You know, some some logics, again, this, this is a meta logic theorem, right? Some logics you can prove that there's only ever one way to apply the rules. Um, the semantic systems we've looked at are like that. If, if you if you see an expression in front of you, you know, it's either a while expression or an if expression or an assignment or whatever. And that grammatical structure tells you which rule you have to apply next to do your proof. But when you get into unification, um, it is no longer obvious which rule should be applied because it, these types can shift their value um, or they can shift the, the way they're expressed under polymorphism. Um, and so you then, 
as well as the rules, you need an, an algorithm to decide how to apply the rule. So what you actually get in a language is Hindley Milner plus an algorithm. So this is an expression of algorithm W. Um, they've kind of written the algorithm into the rules in this case by putting unification in there. But there's also an algorithm J and a bunch of others. You know, pe people can propose new ways um, of applying the rules and type in front, which all have different properties. So I think W is a relatively slow algorithm, but it's easier to prove theorems about. And J is the one I think you actually get in Pascal and ML, kind of faster but, but dirtier. So yeah, okay, that answers my question. Okay, that's really, really interesting. There's still a lot of research being done here, right? If you're looking to do a PhD in language design, tons of things still to be done in this area. Yeah, which brings us to the future, yeah. Um, most of these are still pipe dreams. You know, we would like to have languages that are actually defined using this stuff for real. Um, and yeah, academics have been talking about this for a long time and yet the languages that are used in the real world pretty much are still just hacked together and yeah, you have these reference implementations that are just someone's code and you kind of hope that everyone else implementation of the language does something vaguely similar. As far as I know, the only language that has done this properly is ML. So ML is fully defined through these kinds of semantics. You can download the PDF. There's a, a book called the, the, the Description of Standard ML or whatever, the Specification of Standard ML. And it's about a hundred page of LaTeX logical sequence, which are the official and complete description of the language. Um, that means that all the implementations of standard ML can then be proved to actually work and to deliver exactly what was in the specification. Verification of individual programs could be done possibly from the semantics. Usually it isn't. When you use VCC or Floyd Hall logic, that's a different kind of logic and it's not as strong as these semantic definitions. If there is research ongoing about how you take how do you take the definition of standard ml and use that as the input to your program verifier directly well thanks gary gary's just posted the definition of standard ml so again you you can almost see what's going on in here now it uses a slightly different notation from this lecture but you can see you know, roughly that is a full language specification and it is a bunch of logical sequence right they've each got a number in brackets to the side and if your system implements all those sequence then you have an implementation of standard enough yeah semantic compilers why why has this not happened yet <laughs> so <laughs> the guy who taught logic to me larry paulson um also involved in isabel and ml um he wrote his thesis on this in 1982 at stanford you know, he proposed one of the first semantic compilers and this was supposed to be the feature in 1982 you were going to feed that pdf file of standard ml definition into a semantic compiler and out would come your compiler um, you know as we do for syntax with flex and bison very interesting question which i don't know the answer to why that still isn't in widespread use once you have your language in a formal definition you can then do meta logic on it and, and we would like to have languages that are safe secure and deterministic so again you can do this for standard ml you can show that it really really works um you know there was a famous case with java i remember when, when i was a student um Cambridge language researchers managed to prove that Java was not type safe. They were running all this analysis on the meta logic and they, they found ways to break Java, you know, which then creates a security. So 
situation. So, you know, if if this was to really happen, um, we would have languages that are safe. We'd have programs that could be verified directly from the same semantics used to define the language. You could prove that your implementation actually did what it said on the tin, rather than trying to get through a 1,000 page English language specification of C++, which is probably riddled full of contradictions and omissions. You, know, you could actually prove that there were no contradictions or omissions by using the, the meta logic. And it's a standing joke. You know, every time a new C++ standard comes out, it becomes a little more like standard ML. <laughs> the ML people are the only person, the only people I know of who have really done this. And they did it a long time ago, right? It was formalized in 1997. Um, we're still waiting for the rest of the world to, to catch up and bring those ideas into applications to make the world a safer place. <laughs>